Hello and welcome to GameShack. This is the TurboGrafx-16 Part 2. In fact, Part 1 was six years ago. Six years ago. Six very long years. I've actually been wanting to do another TurboGrafx episode because it has been long. Of course, we put some games here and there, but nothing completely dedicated to the system like this one today. But as we did in that first one, Joe did an overview of the system. We're going to have you do that again, but this time I imagine you're going to want to open the thing up, which you didn't do that in the first time. That's around. true. Let's check it out. You may know the Turbo by several different names. The Turbo Graphics 16, the PC Engine, or even the Turbo Duo. Released in Japan in 1987, it was designed to compete with the Nintendo Famicom. But when it was released in the US in 1989, it was shoved into the 16-bit era, competing directly with the Genesis and eventually the Super Nintendo. The system was versatile enough to compete in both generations with an 8-bit Hue C6280 CPU running at 7.16 MHz, a 16-bit graphics processor, and 6-channel stereo sound. It was also the very first video game console to feature a CD-ROM peripheral. There was also the Super Graphics, an upgraded version of the PC Engine with four times the memory and a second graphics chip. This console only received five exclusive releases, but it could play every single PC Engine game. All in all, nearly 700 games were released for the PC Engine and the Turbo Graphics, but only 138 of these ever came out in North America. In Japan, the system outsold both the Nintendo Famicom and the Sega Mega Drive for a time, but sadly it never gained much of a foothold in the West. All right, Joe, another great overview as usual. And well, thank uh, you. All right, I'm not done yet. Anyways, a lot of people probably like that just as much as I did, but let's get right to the games because that's what you're here for, right? Indeed, the games. Here's Tiger Road, originally from Capcom, imported to the console by Victor Musical Industries. In this side-scrolling action platformer, you take control of Li Wang from the Olin Temple. As Li Wang was traveling, his temple was ruined and the sacred scrolls were taken. You must now fight to regain these sacred scrolls so you can use the double-headed tiger fighting technique. This is a fun port of the arcade game, but it can be frustrating at times. Your character controls well, but your enemies will piss you off. They like to jump and attack you and mostly try to land on your head, it seems. This wouldn't be a problem if you could just attack upwards. You have three weapons that you can collect throughout the game and only the axe seems to land hits on enemies coming from above. The ball and chain is a good weapon and fun to use. The sword on the other hand is the worst and you'll feel like you're handicapped when you're using it so I suggest just avoiding it. Besides the platforming stages there are others where you float upwards avoiding enemies or spikes to get to the exit. You even get to fight a boss while floating around and that's cool. The boss has an easy pattern but be careful because he deals mega damage and takes half of your life bar with one hit. There's tons of stuff to collect in this game, from power-ups to extra points to bottles that replenish your life. The developers thought it would be pretty funny to add these yellow bottles that'll drain your life. But after you collect them a few times, you'll pretty much learn to avoid them. Overall, it's a good game with solid action and decent music. This is Samurai Ghost from Namco, released in 1992. You take control of the undead samurai Kagekyo, who's risen from the dead to defeat his old enemies, which of course saves the earth from invading spirits. I really do like the art style of this game with skeletons, skulls, and death everywhere. I like in certain levels where the sun and the moon rise in the background. I died a few times in this stage, and the sun and the moon were different every time. That's cool. At first glance, your character looks like he's a marionette like Ernest Evans by the way he moves. Luckily, he doesn't control that way, and to be honest, the control is pretty good. The sword takes a bit of getting used to with its stiff motions, but once you get the feel for it, you won't have many issues. The difficulty level is up there, mainly because they throw a lot at you, but of course, once you start to learn the level, it gets easier. You can also collect weapon power-ups like a projectile or a stronger sword slash, but these run out quickly. It would have been nice if they just last a little bit longer. With good artwork, lots of parallax scrolling, and a worthy soundtrack, Samurai Ghost is a nice game for your collection. We gotta mention Bonk's Adventure, right? 
He was originally intended to be the mascot for the system, but found his way onto other consoles as well. You smash your enemies with your head, but that's not the only thing that you can use your head for. You can bounce on these colored florets which give you fruit for points and health and even meat. Eat enough meat and you get super pissed off and rage attack all of your enemies for a limited amount of time. You can even flip through the air if you turn on the turbo switches on your controller and bypass nearly half of the stages. Most of the stages are actually pretty long. I really like the colorful cartoon style graphics. The bosses all look especially cool and it's really fun to fight them. I also really dig the music. Overall it's a pretty damn good game. The next year we got Bonk's Revenge and it was mostly more of the same. The stages are all new and everything is very lively and colorful. But there's now an occasional mid-boss and some tougher enemies to fight throughout the stages. Bonk also has a couple of new abilities like being able to breathe fire when he's powered up on meat. And now it's a bit harder to bypass the stages by floating across them, but most stages weren't designed to be wide open enough to do that anyway. It feels like they took a little bit more time planning the stages of this one out. The graphics have improved quite a lot and help make the world feel much more lively. Not only that, but the music has really improved too. And nearly two years later we got Bonk 3 Bonk's Big Adventure. Again, it's mostly more of the same. The gimmick with this one though is that if you eat a piece of blue candy, you grow into a huge ass bonk and you can really cause some damage. Or if you eat the red candy, you shrink into tiny bonk and you're able to gain access to new areas. These are kind of fun and do add a bit of freshness to the series. The graphics really haven't improved, but the music is completely different this time, and it's still fairly good. There was also a CD version of this game released. Believe it or not, besides the music, this is actually the inferior version of the game. When you're giant bonk, there's far less animation on the CD version. And sadly, the Hue card and the CD are both crazy expensive these days, with the CD over $300 and the Hue card even more than that. Japanese version's cheaper though. But be careful, because there is a repro version of the CD, and people even like to sell that for high prices online. For me, the first two games are my favorite, with the original holding a special soft spot. But the second one is probably the best playing and best designed bonk game on the system. But no matter which one you go with, you're gonna get a good game. Here's Gamola Speed by UPL released in 1990 only in Japan. In this action puzzle style game, you must collect the body parts of your snake. Once you do this, then you enclose your body around these orange things, which are food. And when you've done that, the exit opens up and off you go to the next level. It's actually a bit tougher than that when enemies are thrown into the mix. If they touch your body, segments will fall off and you have to collect them again. If they touch your head, then well, of course that means you're dead. So don't do that because it's not good for you, okay? Your character controls very well considering all you have is the D-pad. If you had an analog stick, I think it would make the action a bit more enjoyable. I'm surprised this hasn't been remade for a current system that supports analog control. Spending 5 minutes with this game will get you hooked and you'll want to keep playing to see the next board. Plus the music is actually pretty good. Not every track is amazing but it really goes well with the gameplay. So if you can play Japanese Hue cards then it's worth a purchase. Let's take a look at a few more Japan only games. This is Alice in Wonder Dream, a pretty solid action platformer that was released in 1990 by Face. It's a good looking game that's very colorful. Alice has a couple methods of attack. Firstly she can yell at her enemies and it works pretty well except that you can only have one yell on screen at a time. But you can charge up that yell for a more powerful shot. She can also jump on her enemies just like Mario. As you play the game you acquire magic like this ability to reveal hidden items. The game is difficult and it has some hit detection issues, but luckily it has an enjoyable high energy soundtrack to keep you interested.
Here's Liquid Kids by Taito, released in 1992. In this single-player action platformer, you take control of Hippopo and you set off to rescue your girlfriend. Hippopo has water bombs for weapons. He can throw multiple at a time or hold the 2 button in for a slightly larger bomb. Enemies don't die when hit with a water bomb, but they do freeze. Once you touch them, then they fly off the screen and they die horribly, I presume. If you're good enough, you can chain enemies together for higher points. There's lots of little icons here and there to collect for points as well. The game is very fun and Hopopo controls really well even though he can't change his direction during a jump. The graphics are nice and colorful and the music complements the gameplay. Definitely a game to have in your PC Engine library. Sun Sun 2 is a side-scrolling action platformer from Capcom released by NEC Avenue. NEC Avenue. You play as Sun Sun and you're trying to save your friends from a mysterious shadow figure that was shown in the intro. Your staff is your main weapon and is quite useful. You can also get magic from shops like these peaches that you can throw at your enemies. These are kind of a pain in the ass since you have to hit the 1 and 2 buttons at the same time to throw them. You'll collect a lot of fruit that enemies drop and that are hidden in walls. The fruit is used as currency in the shop, so collect all that you can. I'm not gonna lie, this game is tough. Boy, I've been having a lot of hard times with these games, Joe. <laughs> the enemy placement seems cheap at times, and when you die, it's game over unless you purchase to continue from the shop. All in all, it's still a fun game, though. You know, Dave, it's amazing the kind of games that the Turbo Graphics and the PC Engine have. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they totally ignore the system, it, but it has a lot of fun games. It has a ton of fun games, and that's the whole thing. It's like, why in America, why was it Sega, Nintendo, and Turbo on the outside when it had all these quality titles? Well, let's take a look at some more of these quality titles, and some maybe not so quality. Yeah, maybe some. Bloody Wolf is a cool overhead run and gun. It's two player simultaneous in the arcade, but it's single player only here. You begin the game with a mission to rescue the president who's been kidnapped by the enemy. Who exactly this enemy is, we never really know, but we sure as hell like blowing them away so it doesn't matter. You have a machine gun and grenades, and both of these weapons can be powered up. You'll definitely need a controller with a turbo switch for this one, and I cannot imagine playing without one. In the game, you'll need to rescue hostages to get items and information. The game can be tough until you learn the patterns, but you do have unlimited continue, so it shouldn't be that huge of an issue. There is a hell of a lot of slowdown here, and it gets pretty bad. Still, the game is enjoyable with average visuals and fun music. Last Alert for the CD-ROM is another cool overhead single-player running gun. This one is experience-based and you gain more life and weapons as you commit more and more murders. This one has a lot more stages than Bloody Wolf and they're bigger too. But of course, being a CD game, you'd expect that since CDs have UNLIMITED STORAGE! However, the game as a whole is a little easier, especially since it saves your progress. That's okay though, because it's still really fun to play through multiple times. Some missions have you running all over the place, planting bombs or even rescuing hostages and the like. The graphics are kind of plain, but good. The music is really cheesy, but still somehow very enjoyable. Of course, the standout feature in this game is the comically bad voice acting. Guy Kazama, if you don't want the hostage killed, you should keep quiet. Guy, the stealth bomber is in the back of this factory. It doesn't get much better than this. Overall, based on the gameplay alone, I think I prefer this one over Bloody Wolf. But if you add in the thick layer of cheese that this one has, then it's no contest. Don't get the Japanese version, you need the English version. It's a great game, and one I definitely recommend if you have a CD system. Fool, Almond's already been taken away. Well, then all I need to do is let you tell me where he is.
Shadow of the Beast even got a port on the duo, though the game only calls itself Beast. This is a fairly fun port of a game that's based mostly on memorization as there's lots of running around to do, keys and power-ups to find, and enemies to defeat. The game design can kind of seem a little bit weird at times. I mean, there'll be spikes or branches that come down on you for no reason whatsoever. Or random thrusters here for no reason other than just to harm you. I mean, why else would they be there? To launch the ceiling into space? You're in an underground cave. Ah well, that's okay. That was the way European game design was back then. No rhyme or reason. Doesn't mean it can't be fun. And yes, of course, being a European game, the water drops will hurt you, so avoid them. Anyway, like I said, it's still fun though, and the scrolling in the outside portion is outstanding for the turbo. In fact, the graphic detail everywhere is actually quite amazing. The standout feature for me though is the music. Hell, the game is worth getting for the soundtrack alone. It destroys the soundtrack in the 2016 reboot game. And the gameplay here is tighter than it is on the Genesis versions. Who says that the Turbo doesn't have absolutely the best sports games ever to grace a console? Well, actually, pretty much everyone says that, but it does have John Madden Duo CD Football. I mean, this is clearly all you need. Check out these insane full motion graphics here. TTI presents the latest in digital video technology. John Madden Football for the Turbo Duo. And look how happy John Madden is to be on the Turbo. He can't contain himself. As a game, it's okay. Huddle up, sports fans. You're about to experience the most intense action ever felt in a video game. It plays like the Genesis and the Super Nintendo versions for the most part. But sadly, there are no passing windows. But what they did put in the game is lots of full motion video of the referee telling you how it is. First down. You also get the occasional shot of the massive crowds cheering for you. And if you make a touchdown, some high school player in a different uniform comes in to spike the ball. Out of all two football games on the console, this one is the best. First down. Valkyrie no Densetsu is an action-adventure game released in Japan by Namco or Namcot or whatever the hell they were calling themselves back then. You play as a Valkyrie sent from Valhalla to save the country of Marvel Land. As you can see, the game is played from an overhead view. Your character can shoot in eight directions, which is nice, but sometimes those diagonal shots are kind of tough to pull off. You make your way through each of the seven levels, killing everything in your path. You'll meet people along the way that will give you items like this rainbow ball thing that fills your magic meter. Magic is easy to use as you just have to hold in the 2 button for a few seconds. Eventually you'll make your way to a boss fight. These are fun and typically not too difficult. The game looks great and I like the art style of your character and the enemy sprites. The music I found to be really enjoyable and it only adds to the experience. Do try this one, you will like it! Godzilla is a fighting game by Alpha System that was released on CD for the Turbo Duo in 1993. In the single player game, you fight as Godzilla and you can choose between two different battles at the start of each round. This is good because it adds some replayability. The bad part is that you can only fight as Godzilla. If you're able to play with two players, then you have the option of picking other monsters. The gameplay is pretty sluggish and Godzilla controls just like you'd expect a 25 ton monster to. So I guess I should say that it's spot on instead of sluggish. Graphically, it does have some nice character sprites and the backgrounds are interesting, which is always a plus in fighting games. The music is good, but you know, it doesn't seem to fit the action. This is Poppin' Magic, which of course was only released in Japan from Telenet. This one or two player game plays on a single screen and it might remind you of some of Taito's stuff. You know, like Bubble Bobble or, you know, one of those. 
This one doesn't seem to be related to magical poppin' on the Super Famicom as far as I can tell anyway. Basically, you shoot the enemies with your wand and this imprisons them in a colored bubble. You can then shoot the bubble a bunch of times to destroy it. Or you can pick it up and toss it into another bubble to increase your rewards and power-ups. Be careful not to toss a bubble into the same colored bubble though as the enemy will reappear and he'll be all pissed off and stuff. Honestly though, instead of tossing bubbles into each other, I usually just try to destroy them with my wand. It's tedious as hell, but it's honestly the safest way. Eventually you'll get to a boss encounter, and I feel that these are the best parts of the game. Between each world are cutscenes, and the characters sure have a hell of a lot to say to each other. Oh my god, skip! The graphics are very saturated, and I like how often the scenes change. The music is okay, nothing really stood out very much for me. I'm not very good at these kinds of games, but I always end up playing this one for quite a while. Super Star Soldier is the second game in the Star Soldier series. This vertical shooter looks, plays, and especially sounds a lot like Blazing Lasers, also on the Turbo Graphics. You've got some cool weapons, and the music is decent. When you get hit, your weapons drop a level until they bottom out, at which point you die. Otherwise, honestly, this game kind of bores me to tears. It's not that this is a horrible game or anything, there's just nothing really special about it. Thankfully, things got a lot better with Final Soldier. As you guessed, this is meant to be the final Soldier game ever. Sadly, this one was only ever released in Japan. The gameplay feels a bit smoother, the stages are much more interesting, and overall the game is just really, really fun. You can even choose how you want your weapons to work before you start the game. The options you get that follow you around can be sacrificed for a really cool special weapon. The stages can be kind of long, but you know what? That's okay, because the music is outstanding. Hell, I wish the stages were even longer than they are. Plus, being the final game in the Star Soldier series, you get to see how this epic saga ends. Turns out that Final Soldier was all a big lie because then we got Soldier Blade. This one definitely has the best graphics of the bunch. There are some nice colors, even a few parallax effects, and overall it's just very well drawn. And fortunately it plays really well too. You can still sacrifice one of your options for a special attack, but your options here depend on your weapon. So each color has its own type of special. What's cool is that you can stock three of them at a time, though only one of them follows you around on screen. The action is very intense, and as always, it's pretty easy to power yourself back up if you get hit or die and lose everything. And it goes without saying that the music is fantastic, though not quite as good as that in Final Soldier. I like the sound effects as well, with some smooth panning of your weapon fire as you move left and right across the screen. This is a series that really improved over time, and the last two games on the system here are outstanding. My god, we've talked about a lot of games. Are we done yet, Joe? Oh, hell no, Dave. I mean, there are a lot of great games for the system. Let's take a look at a few more. Let's keep rolling. Ordine from Namco is a port of an arcade shooter and it was released in 1990. Don't worry, folks, I won't call it a cute em up because the term is starting to get old and a bit annoying. But it is very cartoony and very colorful. And cute. You play as Dr. Tamari trying to rescue his girlfriend and a key that she's wearing around her neck that can unlock the Ordine nuclear reactor. I wonder which one he'd like to have back more. The key or his woman? I think the key, because without it, they'd both be gone. I like that his ship has no canopy, which lets his hair blow freely in the wind and also lets bugs splat on his face. Your basic weapons are your main gun and a bomb. You can enter a shop that appears a few times during a level and buy weapon power-ups and speed boosts, which makes it kind of like Fantasy Zone in a way. 
This would be really cool if whatever weapon you bought would last more than a few moments. What's worse is that they start immediately when you leave the shop, so you can't even save them for a boss fight. Just flip your turbo switches up and use the default weapons. The graphics and music are fair, but sadly this one had to be scaled back from the arcade quite a bit. This is a decent shooter that can bring a bit of enjoyment, but is far from amazing. Cotton is a super CD shooter that was released for the system in 1993 by Hudson Soft. You play as Cotton riding your broom around dealing lots of pain and death. Small fairies will accompany you and can help you a little bit in battle. Enemies will drop crystals that you can shoot to change their color. Each color will help Cotton when she collects it by giving her experience which will upgrade her weapons. They also will give her magic attacks that are very helpful on bosses. To do the magic attacks you must hold in the fire button for a couple seconds. It's quite easy, but you'll want to play with the turbo buttons on for rapid fire. So, when you want to do a magic attack, you have to turn the turbo buttons off. It's slightly annoying because it's an extra step, but you know, what are you going to do? The graphics are amazing. I've always loved the backgrounds and the enemy sprites with skeletons and evil looking trees and whatnot. The soundtrack is also exceptional, and this is just a fun game to play. And how about a little Galaga 90 from Namco? This is a really nice port of the arcade game which was called Galaga 88. In the beginning you can choose from a single ship or a double ship right off the bat. The action starts off feeling very similar to the original with enemies streaming in from the sides of the screen. The play mechanics are the same as you can only go left and right on the bottom. You can still get your ship captured and then rescue it again. I like how some of the enemies blow up and make fireworks at the same time. Eventually, you'll open up a warp dimension, which I guess takes you to the 90s. The screen now scrolls vertically as you fight a few ragtag enemies that come on screen. Eventually, the enemies will just appear all in formation. There's also music now where there wasn't before the dimensional warp, and there's even boss fights. It truly is the 90s! This is a great addition to your turbo library, so get it now while it's not overly expensive and before people start accusing us of driving up the price. Here's Hana Takadaka, released only in Japan in 1991 by Taito. Yes, it's another very bright and very colorful shooter. Don't let the aesthetics fool you though, because this is not an easy game. Or is it that I just suck at shooters? There's plenty of enemies that come at you at all times and lots of them take multiple hits. Plus, everything that you kill turns into a raccoon and falls from the screen and that can be very distracting. And yes, I know it's Tanuki, but hey. But luckily you can collect power-ups that will really help your weapon. Once you do have a weapon power-up, just quickly charge up your power meter and unleash it. These are very helpful, but only last while you're big. When you take hits, your character shrinks and then you'll have to resort to firing your weapon with the turbo switches on. Still, it's a fun game with a decent soundtrack and it's definitely worth a try. This is Fozet Amor for the Super CD and it was only released in Japan. This game has so much potential to be awesome. You play as this sexy lady who's trying to save the world from demons or something, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. Your main weapon is a whip which you can fire off in any direction except down. If you press the jump button again while you're in the air, your whip fires up and can attach to a platform, kind of like Bionic Commando. You can collect three different colored special attacks which happen if you press down and attack at the same time but only if you're in the air. And you can use this an unlimited amount of times. Like ghouls and ghosts, once you get hit your armor flies off. Get hit again, you become naked and of course being naked means instant death. You have many chances to get your armor back throughout any given stage though. The visuals are for the most part excellent and really well drawn. Where the game fails however is the stage design. There's rarely ever any need to use your special Bionic Commando style moves. Really, the game should be full of this stuff. The stages are also slow and the checkpoints are very few and far between. Ghosts and Goblins and Ghouls and Ghosts got this aspect right, but this game just gets boring. 
What brings it down even more is the extremely repetitive soundtrack. Seriously, just put on your own music. Honestly, my favorite thing about this game, other than its potential, is the music in the title screen. This game could be so awesome, but it ends up just being, yeah, kinda good. The Turbo Graphics even got an exclusive Adventure Island game called New Adventure Island. That's right, this is brand new. Still, it's based on the old Adventure Island, actually the oldest Adventure Island with its gameplay style. That means you've got to keep getting fruit to keep your health bar from draining, you've got to get weapons from eggs, and try not to get hit because you die in one hit. Regardless of the familiar gameplay style, there's still plenty of new weapons, stages, and bosses here to keep it fresh. I mean, how can it not be fresh? This is New Adventure Island! It's new! The graphics and music are both good, but to be honest, I did expect a little more from a game that appeared so late in the console's life. It's still worth having if you can find it for a few bucks, which of course you can't. Want to see the true power of the Turbo Graphics 16? Then look no further than Falcon from Spectrum Holobyte. You're a hothead air jockey and you get to choose your own weapons in this adrenaline pumping action fest. Take off and get ready to blow up the enemies, all of which happen to be right near the base where you just took off from. Hell yeah! The combat is so real, you'll even feel the G-forces as you spin out of control. Yes, it's Falcon on the TurboGrafx-16 from Spectrum Holobyte. This is why you game on a console and not a PC. Equally as powerful, if not even more so, is Gunboat. You're put where everyone wishes they could be, and that's in the middle of the Vietnam War. Get briefed by your COs, arm your gunboat, and then get ready to destroy Charlie. The graphics are almost too real. The game is so lifelike that you'll be treated horribly by society after you're done playing as you attempt to deal with the terrors that you've seen. And yes, seriously, both Falcon and Gunboat are quite terrible. This is March in Maze from Namco, and as you can guess, it was only released in Japan. It's an overhead action game where you take control of Alice. You play the game on board suspended high up in the air. Alice can shoot bubbles at her enemies, which will knock them back and off the sides of the level. Holding the 2 button in will produce a slightly bigger bubble, which will knock her enemies back even further. But be wary, because your enemies will do the same thing to you. If you get knocked off the sides, you have a reserve of two balloons that will bring you back up to the playfield. It gets pretty hectic at times, with lots of enemy shots coming at you from all directions. The game is generally fun and is definitely tough. But are you tough enough? I guess you'll have to play to find out. The graphics are like the music, which are passable but not amazing. Here's Final Lap Twin by Namco, released in 1990. If you like RPGs and you like racing games, then this title is for you as it's a mixture of both genres. There's two ways to play this game. The first is like any old racing title, advancing from one circuit to the next. The races in this game are always split screen. But there's more than meets the eye with this game. There's also a quest mode. Here you can walk around town and get information. You can buy and equip new parts to your car. And of course, what RPG would be complete without random battles, which are actually just races. When you're walking outside of town, you'll get accosted by random people that want to race you. If you win this one lap race, then you collect a nice sum of money and move on from where you are. If you lose the race, then you get sent back to your house where your dad consoles you and gives you 300 bucks. So either way, you're still making money. The game is fun and it's definitely challenging until you start building up your car stats. It's a novel idea and a refreshing take on the racing genre. Let's take a quick look at all of the Super Graphics games, I mean why the hell not? 1941 Counter-Attack is a port of the arcade game from Capcom. This is how the 1940 series of games were always meant to be. Lots of fast, incomprehensible action going on all over the place and even an annoying alarm when you're near death. 
Who doesn't love that? Now, the scrolling isn't always smooth, but at least the music is pretty much always excellent. It's not the best game on the poor Super Graphics, and it doesn't really show off much of the console's power, but it's still not bad at all. All Dines is the horizontal shooter for the Super Graphics. It's okay, I mean, again, it's not horrible or anything, but it's not outstanding. There is some decent parallax scrolling in this one, though. You can generate a little shield to block bullets, remove small obstacles, and destroy weak enemies. But the problem is that you have to disengage the rapid fire switch to use it, and you're not gonna wanna do that. The music is, again, really, really good, though. Grand Zort is a pretty good action platformer. During the gameplay, you can switch between one of three robots at any time. Of course, each one has their own unique powers and weaknesses. You'll need to use each in different situations. The super graphics powers are used here for true overlapping parallax scrolling in every direction, and generally the game looks pretty good. The music isn't bad, but it's not really anything noteworthy either. No pun intended. Overall, the game is enjoyable and it's rather challenging, but it's certainly not the most in-depth game of its time. The best game on the Super Graphics is the port of Dai Makai Mora, or Ghouls and Ghosts as it's known here in the West. This one has more memory than the Genesis game, and as a result tends to be more faithful to the arcade. With the exception of the scrolling layers here, which somehow they messed up compared to every other version. That's okay, it doesn't break the gameplay or anything. The game is incredibly fun, as well as challenging. I've always thought Ghouls and Ghosts was the best game in the entire series. That's right, I like it better than Super Ghouls and Ghosts. Deal with it. This version offers only a limited amount of continues, though. Yes, you have to go through the game twice to properly finish it. And yes, of course I beat it. It truly is a fantastic game, and if you have a Super Graphics, you absolutely have to have this one. This is Battle Ace, the one Super Graphics game we couldn't review in our Super Graphics episode. Well, here it is, and you fly an aircraft shooting down enemies while avoiding their attacks, and sometimes other things floating in the air. You have a regular gun as well as lock-on missiles, both of which have an unlimited supply. The stages are pretty long, but eventually you'll get to a boss. You'll also encounter challenges like trying to fly through these stupid rings. Be careful because one hit and you're dead, and it seems like it takes eight minutes to finish dying. You see, I'm still dying. Generally, this one's rather boring to play. If this uses the power of the super graphics, I'm not sure how. I mean, it's fairly unimpressive. The music isn't bad, and it's probably the best thing about the game, sadly. There's really not much more to say about Battle Ace. The only other Super Graphics compatible game is Darius Plus. This is just a PC Engine game, but when you play it on the Super Graphics, there's a bit less flicker since the Super Graphics can put more stuff on screen at any given time. It's pretty hard to tell the difference, though. If I were you, I'd just go play Ghouls and Ghosts instead. All right, now we are done with episode number two of Turbo Graphics. Indeed. And the Turbo Graphics is an awesome system, especially oh, yeah. when you're able to play the imports and stuff mm -hmm. like that. There's a lot of shooters out there. If you like that kind of thing, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the system for you. It really is. So what other games are out there? Because, you know, the library in Japan is way huge. So let us know what other games we should be looking at. And in the meantime, thank you for watching Game Set.
up, Joe? Oh, hi, Dave. Check out the TurboGrafx-16. It's a video game console that has many great games to play, especially when you factor in the ability to play Japanese imports. <laughs> Joe, I'm sorry, but you're an idiot. I mean, look at this. You've got so many choices here. You, your TV's not even on because you can't make a choice. You have way too many games here. This is just ridiculous. I'm sorry, but... Now, Joe, I'm a busy guy. I don't have time for you to show me another video game system where you have way too many games to choose from and you never actually get around to play anything. Oh, hi, Dave. Check out the Super Graphics. It's a video game console which has not more than five games. Now this is more like it. With such a limited selection, you never waste any time sifting through a massive library of games from many prolific developers. Too many choices can be overwhelming, and with the Super Graphics, there are only two genres represented. There's 1941, which is a shooter. There's Aldines, which is a shooter. There's Battle Ace, which is a shooter. There's Ghouls and Ghosts, which is a platformer. And there's Grandzor, which is also a platformer. There's no need to even turn on the TV because it's simply easier to choose not to play since there's not much available. Only the Super Graphics respect the burden of too much choice placed on modern society. And what's cool is that the Super Graphics can also play the entire library of PC Engine games. What? Uh-oh.